All right. Good morning. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Or evening, I suppose. <laughs> or evening, yeah, true. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm back at home. Which finally, is, man. Well, it's good, but it's also not good. It's 92 degrees and it's 10 a.m. Pros and cons. It's absolutely miserable outside, so my kids can't go outside because trying to put sunscreen on a four-year-old is sort of like trying to put sunscreen on a very large flappy fish <laughs> and uh, and she wants no she wants nothing to do with it but i also don't want a bright red uh painful sunburn all over Let's yeah you just need to be careful these days <laughs> so but it is nice to be home back in uh <clears throat> back in the land of good internet at least so yeah, and good equipment. Yeah. You're not off just your laptop like the last times. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm back on a uh, back on a real machine, so maybe <laughs> maybe it won't take half of my PC's resources just to do the stream on top of everything else that we're doing. So Exactly. <sighs> and what what are we doing today, man? What are um, we doing today? So last week we did Blazor with um, Blazor server side with Azure AD, right? Which was cool um, because we could get signed in really pretty similarly to how we did before. And we talked to the graph. So we got a token. Yep. We went and talked to the graph. We did our user read, our mail read, and we showed the um, surprisingly inoffensive emails in my inbox. <laughs> it was just spam, which is nice. <laughs> but. The biggest pain in all that was that we were using an in-memory token cache. Correct. And because we were using an in-memory token cache, every time we restarted the app, yeah, we would have to sign out and sign back in because our cache wasn't persisted really anywhere, right? Correct. Yep. So we figured it'd be good to do sort of a proper persisted cache somewhere. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. So, what should we what should we use locally? Should we start with something like uh, distributed cache and like use SQL, well, like local DB, or? I think first of all, it would be nice if we open the docs and just show that uh, the new Microsoft Web has made it super easy to uh, implement a distributed cache uh, or uh, a local cache. And um, the fact that uh, everything is deriving from I distributed cast means that you can also implement your own customized one. So for the, the newer, latest uh, actual web, it becomes much easier to, um, to do it. Uh, right. But so I think today, I think yesterday they were discussing something about um, Cosmos DB. So I was wondering if we should take a stab at that and use a Cosmos DB as distributed, or we can go with the one which is out of the box. And that's the um, SQL. You can use SQL or Redis uh, are the two options, if I remember correctly. Uh, there's a Stack Exchange Redis as well. So there are a few options. If you, if you go to Docs in GitHub, you should be able to find the appropriate um, the appropriate documentation. Oh, that's right, because identity.web has a wiki. Has a wiki indeed. And that wiki has a whole lot of great information, right? Yeah, so on the right hand side, there you go, talking cache realization. In fact, let's put this, uh, put this link in the chat. Absolutely. <clears throat> for anyone who is, for anyone who's following along. So the wiki actually has some great, some great sort of extra details about mm -hmm. uh, the identity.web library makes it a little bit easier to uh, a little bit easier to get started and in fact we used this last week when we were setting up our new app exactly so let's see so there's a big thing about token cache serialization one of the things we talked about last week was how you use the token cache in mm -hmm. uh, identity.web and an msal really not identity.web but an msal yep the msal token cache um, you can completely build one from scratch if you want but <clears throat> instead you could also just hook into some provided events that we give you right exactly so yep. instead of having to deal with the entirety of a cache so how do you encrypt the data how are you going to decrypt it what are you going to do for managing the data like instead of having to do with deal with that on your own we give you some hooks an after access and a before access 
-hmm. those two hooks are what you use to either write the bytes or read the bytes and hand it back to Imsal. Imsal. And once Imsal Correct. has the bytes, it handles everything else around serializing or deserializing that uh, uh, that token cache. So if you don't have a reason to build your own from scratch, there's really no reason to, right? I mean, yeah, you, you shouldn't, to be honest. Yeah, unless you have a really particular way that you want to do the caching or if you don't like the structures that have been given for doing the caching, there's really not a whole lot of reason to do it on your own um, because in most cases, at least, the majority of the reason why you use a cache is to persist these things somewhere else, right? Is to per persist your tokens somewhere else yes. um, and usually persist them in some sort of durable storage. So if your only concern is durability across reboot or uh, across restarts or if you're working in a farm, you've got multiple nodes and, of course, in cloud literally zero of your nodes are ever guaranteed to, to last longer than a few requests, then you got to have some sort of durable place to keep your, to keep your tokens, right? You can't keep them there forever. <laughs> That's pretty much. If you don't have a reason, you don't have a reason. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it does so, sound like you're like, uh, lying. I mean, uh... Or maybe a John Madden one. You know, if he gets all the way down there, to the end zone, it'll be a touchdown, right? <laughs> JP has a lot of um, uh, wisdom in him, so follow <laughs> along for... <laughs> I don't know if wisdom's necessarily the right word. It might just be arbitrary information. <laughs> I, could, I could put air quotes around wisdom. Uh, how about... <laughs> but there's a whole lot of it. There's a whole lot of arbitrary information in here somewhere. True. Um, right, so, so if you scroll down a little bit on the, uh, on the documentation, you'll see that um, we show you how to implement it, and then... What's even better is that we give you out-of-the-box experiences for um, creating these um, talking caches, especially for distributed ones. Yeah, so we've got we've got three primarily: the in-memory mm -hmm. ones, which are the ones that we were using uh, last week. See here on forty-one. Yep. Um, we've got the session token. So if you're dealing with or if you're using session, um, we can use this to persist your token cache, or if you've configured a distributed cache for one reason, you know, for, for one reason or the other, then you can use an, an I distributed cache, which is part of ASP.NET Core. So what's cool about that is instead of having to manipulate the cache and even hook into the events that we give you in MSAL, identity.web mm -hmm. is going to do it for you, right? Exactly. And in fact, this morning, um, there was an issue that had been open for a few months uh, specifically around manipulating the token cache and how you access it. And uh, it turns out it's been fixed and been closed. <laughs> so Sweet. Um, there you go. I just got that notification like an hour ago, so that's awesome. So I guess to start, uh, what did we... <clears throat> do you want to go Cosmos? Should we do Cosmos to start? Yeah, because like this is my curiosity. As long as the Cosmos DBI distributed cache is implementing the interface, which it does... Mm -hmm. then all we would have to do is technically uh, just plug it in and should be plug and play. Should and we be. can test it. If it doesn't work, then we can go back to SQL or Redis. But uh, I would love to see us being so plug and play that we don't have to worry about anything. And right now, I see you're downloading the emulator because we don't want to spin up uh, a Cosmos DB on Azure and spend money. We want to just test it locally and see how it works because that's fantastic, right? Being able to run Cosmos locally, it's brilliant. And the emulator does that for you uh, so we can we can test it locally see if that works and then if we're happy with it we can uh, push it to Azure yeah that's what I think <clears throat> I figure we might as well just we'll just develop it locally because if it doesn't work then that means I have to go remember to delete a resource <laughs> <laughs> and if oh that, that that's a perfect segue into the Asman software that you we were discussing earlier on right yeah so we'll have to we're gonna have to uh, <laughs> We'll have to do a stream on that. So, so a segment. Yes. A while ago. Oh, uh oh. Oh, I can't even get to my emulator. I wonder why. Um, did you I run it? Is it running? Uh, I did. Open Data Explorer request too long. Hmm. <laughs> I'm guessing there's a bunch of extra header data in here, and it's the only thing I could really. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any? blockers or any odd stuff that could block it from working i mean i guess I'll tr i guess i'll try it in a different window wow that's yeah, a little that's a little weird but okay there that's we go disheartening. 
Oh, right. or maybe it took time to spin up the all the resources. Well, who knows? This is like Windows Beta, <coughs> Edge Canary, and who knows what? A Visual Studio Preview. Who knows what? Living right. dangerously. Yeah, Living knows, dangerously, my friend. <laughs> who knows what the state of this is? So, yes. uh, so this is our emulator, right? So this is our Cosmos DB emulator, and it's pretty. Um, it's pretty similar to what you. Oops, pretty similar to what you get in uh, uh, in the portal, right? So a lot of the exploring or the explorer views are kind of the same. Create a new container, create a new database. Um, but for us, for right now, I think primarily all we're really going to need is our connection string. Um, yeah. And mm. at least historically, these secrets were all identical. So every emulator had the same uh, had the same secret. I don't know if that's still the case now. Oh wow. Well, it, but I mean, it was running locally, right? So yeah, so here it is. <laughs> so if you search for that secret, you'll find uh, all sorts of pieces in here. The side effect to that, however, is um, GitHub will give you a bunch of uh, a bunch of alerts and warnings saying, ah, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious to what happens if you go into GitHub and search for that string right now. I don't know if we're ready for this. It'll <laughs> you is, do know that if you search for RSA key, uh, or begin key, or begin secret, then you find thousands upon thousands of um, private and public keys in um, GitHub. I know it's not a uh, it's not a good thing by any stretch. Let's go to GitHub nope. in a window I'm signed nope. into, and let's search for that search for that key. I have a suspicion we're going to find quite a few. Yeah, over, how many? Two thousand. Over there two, you go. Two thousand. That's not too bad. It's even in three wikis, but that's okay because it's it's local. Could be one of our wikis, though. <clears throat> well, I could see the advantage of having consistent, consistent key. keys for a, a local emulator because if you're running tests or in some sort of integration test and you want to run it somewhere, having to do an installation on like a on like a test runner or on a on a load testing box or something on some sort of an agent and then deriving the key from that, I could see that being mm -hmm. a huge pain. Um, That's a good point. So I think here it just it, it certainly makes it makes it a little bit easier. So okay, all right. So let's go back to our docs for um, for the token caches. So all we have to do to identity that web is instead of using an in memory cache, we're going to use a distributed token cache. So we're going to see do it. Add. Love it. It's just a one liner, man. That's it. Add That's all you need. Distributed token cache is cool. And now we have to go configure a cache, right? We've got to go configure our uh, distributed cache. So correct. let's go find a Cosmos DB provider for iDistributed cache. Cosmos DB. And Cosmos is, I like Cosmos a lot. Like it's gotten a lot cheaper too, which makes it a lot easier for dev. I think you can go get one now. Like, in fact, there might even be a free tier now. But there is a free tier. There is a free tier. Let me find it. Yeah, historically there was uh, even the cheapest one was like was only eighteen or nineteen bucks. Um, which, if you're if you're fortunate enough to be working in a um, if you're fortunate enough to be working in a place where you get MSDN, it makes mm -hmm. it yeah you know, that that's well within your well within your allotment so uh, but even if you're not 19 bucks for a, a pretty fast you know globally distributed database isn't too bad true so let's i mean cosmos, cosmos db comes with some amazing uh, features and even if you have to go to a paid version eventually because your application has grown then um it, it definitely gives you many many things that you don't have to worry about uh, if you were using sql or something else where you have to do uh, global distribution of your data and what have you. Yeah. So I, I, I love it. Do you find the right uh, uh, package? Ah, well, it looks like this package is still pre-release. So it's 100 preview 3. Uh, Living looks... dangerously. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> well, so... I mean, uh, Identity Web is still preview as well, so we have to say that. But we are heading towards a GA release uh, very, very soon. So people should be excited about that, as we are. Yeah, let's somebody it. said there is a free tier, very popular with live coders for 
I'm not myself, said. There's a free tier for Cosmos DB, and it's very popular with live coders. That's uh, good oh, to know. Very cool. Very cool. Good. Yeah. Good to know. So this is the extensions caching Cosmos library. We put a link to it. Link to the mm -hmm. repo out here in the chat, so we've got it available. Um, so we've got our uh, we've got our our caching library available. Let's see what is our use for this. So we can use an existing Cosmos client or a Cosmos builder. But Ooh. it is largely, <laughs> it's largely uh, fairly straightforward. There's really not a whole lot here, it doesn't look like, which is great because it means that we'll make a couple config changes and. Correct. So you need four lines, five lines of code to configure and add your Cosmos DB cache. And then you just, uh, and I think it automatically gets picked up by um, identity web. You don't have to explicitly go and say something about. Cosmos DB it will pick up the distributed cache. Yeah. I think this is when you say something like trust the process, right? Yes. <laughs> but that's the dot that's, the pipeline. For, that's what we've done for in .NET for a long time. Um, is you do the things that you're told to do and you're like, okay, I think this is going to work. I hope this is going to work. And then... Well, I like, I like trusting the, the team that has built these things to do it right. So all I have to do is just use it. Yeah. That's true. Let's hope that all we have to do is just use it. <clears throat> Just need the Cosmos cast container uh, yep. string somewhere. Yep. I guess we need to create a, well, oh yeah, create if not exist is set to true. I'm assuming that this is going to create a, a database in a container. Although, exactly. let's see, this is saying it will check for the container existence. So I think we probably have to use a, uh, we probably have to, uh, if we want to change the, throughput we'll have to do that manually or create it up front right so let's go add we've got a new configuration section we need oops and we have what a few different settings here so we've got cosmos cache container in fact these are not even uh let's it's not a section right <clears throat> just the uh, other root let's create a section oh look at you well, we've got other things in here, so... Should we do it out a secret? Uh, like, should we put the key in a secret rather than uh, put it here for best practice? Um, I suppose we could, although it is a... Uh, it is a um, well-known secret. And once we... If we were to... That, that's a good point. You're right. If we were to deploy this to Azure, I don't think we would... You know, we wouldn't use this anyway. We'd use something like... App service config or Azure configuration, key yeah, or key, key vault. vault, yeah. So we have ring on the key vault. So let's see. These are Cosmos Cache container name, Cosmos Cache database name, and Cosmos Cache connection string. Okay. We get these in our settings here. And then let's go grab our connection string out of uh, the emulator. So I guess, I don't know if you can call it a well-known secret. It seems like somewhat of an oxymoron, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, we'll, we'll just call this uh, uh, token cache, and we'll call this the... Uh, Blazor database or something, because we're using on a Blazor. Laser cast. Not very, uh, not very descriptive, I guess. But okay. not as good as Asman. <laughs> you know, that that <laughs> topped the day for me. <laughs> well, well, we need to schedule it up because there's a bunch of service principle work that goes into that. So, okay. So now, in theory, in theory, of course, um, I think we've done everything we need to. Right. So we've we've configured our Cosmos builder. Yes. Um, Let's see. We provide a store state in a container within a database. Both parameters are required within the options initialization. Uh, create if not exist, we'll make sure to create a container if it doesn't exist with an optimized configuration for key value storage. That mm. feels a little opaque, so I'm kind of curious what that means. Um, container throughput can be used to specify a throughput on the container. I mean, I think to start, we 400 RU, uh, the 400, the, the the arbitrary unit for measuring Cosmos performance, right, is 
400 RU is probably plenty. I don't know what their default is, so we should we should dig into that a little bit and see. So what's nice about Cosmos though is, or maybe not even, it's, it's provisioned throughput, right? Mm -hmm. So when you use this, you're saying, um, please carve me out this dedicated chunk of throughput, 400 RU or a thousand request units or whatever, and it gets provisioned. But the downside to that is you're paying for it you're paying for the fact that it's been provisioned regardless of whether or not you're using it, right? So we had blob storage years ago. Uh, it's like the standard blob storage. And standard blob storage was cool because you could allocate a, you know, two terabyte file. And if you wrote, you know, 20K to it, you'd pay for the 20K. Yeah. Um, and then we got premium storage, which was all SSD backed. But it was pay on provision, not pay on use. And Cosmos yes. is the same way. So Cosmos is a pay-on-use uh, type of uh, you know, pre-provisioned service. So when you when you do a provisioning, you're, the, the meter starts to turn immediately, which is something to keep in mind when you're building these things out. Yep. I'm glad you got that mechanical keyboard because it really keeps me... Uh, it makes me feel like I'm sitting right next to you. <laughs> and, and I went for the soft, uh, the, the soft uh, switches, right? I should have gone for the hard ones. <laughs> It should I, sound like a typewriter. It just gives you this this uh, <laughs> satisfaction when you actually commit a letter to the keyboard. I, I don't know. I don't know how everybody <laughs> else feels about mechanical keyboards, but this is my first one, and I love it. So I remember at the library I went to as a kid, which was admittedly you know, 25, 30 years ago, they had IBM... They had IBM machines that had these these green uh, green screen like phosphor monitors on it. But oh, the, yes. The keyboards they had... I mean, you had to have significant finger strength to get those keys down. You know? <laughs> so, like, if you like were, a proper typewriter, you know, if you <laughs> it builds characters, yeah, if you it does build characters. Uh, interestingly <laughs> enough, it's exactly what it did. It built a whole list of them. Um, Look at that! A pun, an accidental pun. Isn't this amazing? <laughs> oh my god, it's too early, and we're gonna scare everybody off. Nobody's ever going to come back. But um, that's a that's a four sold espresso uh, iced coffee this morning, so you can see why I'm so wired up, right? Oh, uh, but the thing I the thing I remember about that keyboard wasn't mm -hmm. how loud it was, right? Because you could always tell when anybody in the library was looking for a book. Yeah, it was the weight of the keyboard itself. Like I don't know if the terminal was in the keyboard, like for for connecting back to whatever the back end was, which I guess was probably some kind of a mainframe, but. The keyboard itself, I mean, that thing probably weighed 10 or 12 pounds. And, um, <clears throat> but it was super satisfying to type on, even if you didn't yes. have anything worth typing. And you would type, and then your characters would show up on the screen about eight minutes later. So, <sighs> good times. But anyway, okay. So we've got our cache configured, we think. And we have MSAL and identity.web configured to use our distributed token caches. So, in theory, when we run this, we should have a token cache get created in uh, Cosmos, and MSAL should start using it, right? So I guess the only thing left to do is run it. Is run it and see what we get. Dun, 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 fingers crossed. It's gonna it's gonna be awesome. Now, I'm telling you, it's gonna work out of the box. Hopefully, build times are a little faster on this machine <laughs> than they were last week because. Last week was uh, last week was pretty brutal. There were certainly days where I was like, "Oh God, it's so slow. It's killing me." So, you are you are now making a very good case for me to build my own box. You know, like a yeah. de desktop <clears throat> after probably over fifteen years of not having a, a desktop. Oh, look at that. Okay. No, the pipeline has already worked, man. Because uh, if there was an issue, it would have blown up by now. Let's see what happens. Well, the the real key, the real test will be after I accept this. And yes. we get redirected over back to the app, and the app tries to swap the um, authorization code for an access token. Mm -hmm. That'll be that'll be the real test to see what's happened. So yes, and when we do that, we'll uh, we'll go check in the emulator and see what's been created. Okay, so we've accepted it, setting consent, which we had to set consent again this time because I. Uh, in my haste, deleted the app registration last week and <laughs> realized that at about seven minutes before, um, realized that about seven minutes before we started. So, okay, so we've got our apps. That's good. Yeah. Um, 
Let's go fetch data. This was our, these are our graph calls. Cool, so it looks like we did get a token and it looks like that token was stored somewhere. So here are my latest emails. You can tell this is an... <laughs> Recent ones as well. Look, you got your, uh, this morning's email about Identity Protection Weekly Digest. Yeah, so you can, so this is the same experience that literally anyone who's an administrator of an Azure AD tenant somewhere has to deal with every week. Yeah, um, I feel like I get the weekly PIM digest about four times a week. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure how that happens, but it does. Um, we want to make sure you get it, not just oh, once. And my old doctor still thinks that I am uh, I'm oh. either pre-diabetic or a heart disease risk. That's that's super fun, but good for me. I haven't seen him in like ten years, so he doesn't even know. And it looks like I can, him. Uh, looks like my bicycle store is selling gravel. Wow. But I'm such a noob when it comes to riding a bicycle that I don't know why you would need gravel if you ride a bike. Okay. Yeah, please tell us why do we need gravel for our bike? Okay. So let's go look at our uh, let's go look at our Cosmos emulator and let's see what if anything actually ended up in here. Okay? Yeah. All right. So here's our explorer. Oh. Request is being made with a forbidden encryption in transit protocol or cipher. Okay. You've broken your um, your emulator today. That's that's crazy. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I can't say I've ever seen. So why on earth is this thing using like TLS one or something? Like why would my why yeah. would I not be able to connect to an emulator? I wonder if the emulator is just like maybe it's old or something. But I can connect to the emulator itself. I just can't make this HTTPS call. I think you can use Storage Explorer to hit your Cosmos, right? Hmm. This is uh, this is pretty weird. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. use Storage Explorer. Let's open Storage Explorer, or maybe I'll Go. just open. Uh, I could just open something like Firefox too, and see if that. No, I, I don't think it's the. Uh, I don't think it's your browser. I think it's something with the underlying emulator engine that's not working well. You think so? Yeah. Well, I mean. I do you have uh, Firefox or Chrome to test the the case? I have Firefox, so let's try Firefox. Okay. Oh, no, same thing. See? Request is being made with a forbidden encryption and transit protocol or cipher. Well, it kind of, it almost kind of feels like, let's zoom in a little bit here on Storage Explorer. It almost feels like it's, because, you know, of course, TLS, TLS has been changing a lot. Uh, it almost, uh, and especially minimum versions, right? Everybody's been pushing to get to TLS 1.2 uh, only, right, as the minimum. So you can't use 1.0 or 1.1, which makes me wonder if perhaps the emulator is still using an older, uh, still using an older, um, uh, an older, older protocol. So, okay, but we can connect to it in Storage Explorer for now. Uh, but yeah, you're right. We should probably raise that that is a bug. So here we've got our emulator. We're connected up in Storage Explorer. And here's our Blazor cache. Here's our token cache collection. Let's look at the documents we've got in here. So we've got one here. It's got an ID. Now, if you remember from last week, that ID probably looks kind of familiar, right? So I know from having used this tenant for a very long time that 98AE34, this is my test tenant. So this is my tenant ID. And I'm pretty sure last week we confirmed that this is my object ID. Does that sound about right? And then the content, of course, is uh, what looks to be base64 encoded data, um, which is pretty much unusable. <clears throat> pretty much unusable directly here in the database. Uh, but that's fine because again, we don't really care about the actual caching implementation itself. We only care about the persistence. But what was cool about this is we didn't even deal with the persistence. Like it was just there and it just worked, right? That's awesome. So we've got this token cache. So in theory, um, I should be able to... That's true, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, this is awesome. Like we we literally copied and pasted two bits of code. And we've we now have a working persistent cache. Now, whether or not we can get the data back out and whatever, we'll test that here in a second. But by adding distributed token caches to Microsoft.identity.web, that is going to configure MSAL, which again, you don't even deal with MSAL directly in here. That's going to configure MSAL so that MSAL will have a durable cache behind it. You don't even have to worry about how do I set up a cache or what do I do? Do I have to have a separate cache just for just for my identity system? If you've configured a cache in um, ASP.NET Core, it just works, right? Um, so this is this is super this is super cool. Uh, I haven't used this yet myself, so the fact that we could get this up and going in two minutes was uh, was pretty 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 cool. I think. <laughs> All right, that's it. We'll see everybody. You know. <laughs> Right, so the process the process died, which meant his last week our in memory cache was gone, which meant that we couldn't go and get data from the graph again because we didn't have a token in our cache that we could go back and use. So now let's see if our token cache gets rehydrated correctly, and it does. So we went back to the graph after having closed the process. Um, meaning our token cache is working correctly because our token cache is pulling in, um, our token cache is getting pulled from Cosmos, which of course is persistent on my local machine because we're using the emulator, which means now we've got a token cache that persists across nodes or uh, persists across uh, worker process recycling or if your app has a catastrophic failure, at any point, now we've got a durable cache that we can use for our tokens, which is super cool. So, oh, oh, I wonder what happened. Oh, I wonder if there, um, was I having an issue perhaps? Well, you're coming, so you're coming through Skype. Oh, okay. I hope you're not muted anymore. Did you hit the mute button? Hmm. Uh-oh. All right, hang on. We'll tell you what. Do you want to um Do you want to hang up and call me back on Skype? Okay. I don't I don't know what happened. It's kind of weird. Yeah, apparently so. Okay. How would I rate the quality of that call? Well, it was good for a while. <clears throat> okay. Let me make sure I get you. And I'm back. Of, make Hopefully, sure I get you hooked back in here. Looks like you're you're back in stream, which is good. So let's see if yeah. we get your audio. Let's hope that the audio is working now. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty Apparently. weird. Apparently, people still want to hear my comments, which is good and Encar encouraging. <laughs> Maybe it was some sort of a, maybe it was like a, a noise canceling algorithm because of your keyboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Duct tape and twine yeah. is probably the best. That's, that's a very generous way, <laughs> way to describe and it. And they but. can hear me now, which is great. Hey, thanks for uh, letting us know. Yeah. You missed all my uh, my snarky comments five minutes ago, but thank you, <laughs> thank you for letting us know. <laughs> so, okay, cool. I'm glad you're back. So, so let's go look at doing token caching the hard way or the manual way uh, without using identity.web, right? So this is if you're using MSAL directly, yep. then, uh, and you want to persist your token caches somewhere else, um, you, know, you have to, you sort of have to do it on your own. So, uh, so this, is, this is back in the either .NET Core pre 3.1 
days where you didn't have identity web or any classic .NET, right? Well, this is anything that can use MSAL. Great. So, and I know you. I know you've been working on a, a matrix of what supported where. Um, mm -hmm. But as long as you can use MSAL, then you can use what we're gonna what we're gonna take a look at here. So, sweet. Uh, we get this. We'll get this solution loaded up here. Should we also cover what the, that scenario was for you when you started building it and uh, what you were trying to do? Because I think just giving a little bit of a background of what you were trying to achieve and why you needed the cast in such a way may make sense for people or inspire sure. some people to build something similar, right? Yeah. So if you remember uh, a few months ago, I'm not entirely sure when this was. It was it was a while ago, though, five or maybe four, five, six months ago. Mm -hmm. There was... Um, presence information published into the graph from teams so people could see your uh, your availability yeah, yeah. Your, your availability they could see if you were busy on a call in a meeting whatever <clears throat> and if anybody remembers years and years ago way before teams we had things like um, LCS and OCS and link and all the different you know renamed executables all of those, uh, also had hooks in them where you could do different things and pull different pieces of data, but they all yep. sort of relied on that server, you know? <clears throat> so the, the side effect was when we moved to Teams, there really wasn't a good way to get presence data, which if you had one of those Embrava lights, mm -hmm. it was um, so like a little light that you could put on your cube to say, hey, you know, this is our... Um, uh, you know, this person's busy, so don't come and bother them because they're on the phone or because of whatever. Mm, yeah. Those kind of didn't work with Teams. I mean, I think there may have been some super convoluted way you could run some software that, you know, use the Skype for Business bridge or something to figure out your, your status and availability and then post it. But um, it, wasn't very, it wasn't very useful and it wasn't very reliable. And so presence information then started getting published to Teams. Uh, and at the time, there was no um, there was no mechanism for um, getting a push of somebody's getting a push of somebody's uh, presence. So if you wanted to read somebody's presence, you literally had to go do that over and over and over again. Go pull the graph and say, hey, what's this user's presence? Hey, what's this user's presence? Hey, what's this user's presence? And then do something with it, right? And so for me, since I'm working at home now and I have three little kids under six and a wife, I wanted to let them know when I was on the phone. So they knew maybe that's not the best time to come and pound on the door and try to get in dad's office, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although I think it had the opposite effect because it's, then they would come and beat on the door and say, Dad, the lights change color, you know. <laughs> so it kind of, I don't know if it necessarily had the had the correct effect. The desired but, effect, yeah. But it, but it, that's cool. I mean, it was fine. They, they had a good time and, 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 and I kind of made it clear like, hey, we can't, we can't do this. So mm -hmm. our goal was to build a, or my goal was to build a replacement for the Embrava link, uh, B-Link light. Okay. And use Philips Hue. Or whatever, right? You could use whatever you ha whatever you want, uh, yep. but I wanted to use Philips Hue because I happen to have a few of them. But I didn't want to pull the graph every five seconds from a something running locally, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to run that same polar from two different places because I also before, of course, before coronavirus, I was still going into the office occasionally, and mm -hmm. uh, at the office, I had a real problem with people driving by. And so if I was on the phone, people would come by and they'd kind of sit around like, oh, are you on the phone? It's like, well, I've got a giant headset on with a big microphone in front of me, so it's possible. <laughs> Talking to myself, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, so I, I had one of these tall um, Ikea lamps, right? It was like, you know, four or five feet tall. Then it had three yeah. bulbs in it. And I thought, oh, this would be perfect. I should use this. That way I'll put it right at the edge of my desk. And if anybody comes by within 20 feet, they'll be like, oh, okay, you know, on the phone, whatever. So <clears throat> what I ended up des deciding to do was to build a, uh, a cloud polar in functions, mm. right? So the cloud polar would go and check presence from the graph. And then when there was a change, it would push that down to subscribers using Service Bus. 
right? Right. Um, so that way I can have local agents that ran here, one that ran at the office, and so that whenever my status would change, instead of each one of those individual uh, pollers polling it, we had one poller, and then could subscribe to many, right? So many yep. subscribers could come and figure that out. So, um, so the side effect of that was that we now need a graph token for a user, right? Because getting getting the uh, getting permission to read every one of your organization's presence at least for me, it was not going to happen. <laughs> like Microsoft is not going to let me read the presence data of the entire org. So instead, I had to use a, a delegated permission. I had to use a permission that was mine, um, or that was specific to me. And so because of that, um, I had to figure out a way to sign a user in, cache them, and then use their refresh token to go and get subsequent access tokens, right? Sweet. Right. Love it. So that was... And the, you, you did all that in functions. I did it all in functions. So, uh, in fact, I've got a diagram. Let me pull it up here. And... And... Oh, and also, yeah, uh, we... We should do this on the uh, Thursday uh, community call. Yep. To review, I, I am not myself's code. Because I remember, I remember getting that right before I left for vacation, and so yep. we should we should take a look at it and, and maybe talk about it on Thursday. Yeah, we will. Yeah, so let's Hopefully do that. We have some answers for you, sir. Yeah, let's do that Thursday on our community call. So, uh, so there's a blog post about this. So this was back in March, so it was sort of right before coronavirus. Yeah. Um, and this is a, this is one of those in Bravo link, B Link lights, right? So this is one of the this is what we used to have, <laughs> right? <laughs> this little tiny light that sat on your desk. And I've got a diagram here. Uh, oh, in fact, here's my uh, here's the light that I put in my cube at work because this was because you know, it was getting sort of out of hand, right? So yeah, uh, this giant you know four foot tall four foot tall lamp that would change colors. So this image here, this is sort of the key of what what we had to what I had to build. So we have a timer function, uh, and that timer function is going to go and query the graph for my current presence for each user who needs to do it. Um, well, first it needs to get the token before it access uh, access the graph, right? It does, which is getting them out of a it gets them out of a table to get yep. the refresh token. Then it goes down to Azure AD with the refresh token uh, mm -hmm. to get an access token. And if you're not familiar with refresh tokens, a refresh token is sort of like a super long lived token to get tokens, right? <laughs> So a refresh token on its own doesn't do a whole lot, except it allows you to present it back to an identity system and say, hey, I need a new token, a new access token that I can use against the service. So yep. if you just sent a refresh token to a service to like the graph, the graph is going to say, well, I have no idea what this is. Mm -hmm. Don't call this number again sort of thing, right? Like, don't, don't try to send me this again. So instead, we present the refresh token to Azure AD in our case. And Azure AD takes that refresh token and will issue us a new access token that's valid for 60 minutes, right? That we can go and use against the graph. This is the same mechanism that things like your cell phone, like the Outlook app on your phone or Teams or Twitter or whatever, that's the same mechanism that they use to, for ongoing access. So when I sign into an app on my phone, for example, um, when I sign into an app, I get an access token and a refresh token if it's Ooh, configured that way. There's a good question. Does Azure AD uh, do refresh token rotation? So if by rotation you mean you get a new one every time you use one, yes. So every time you send in a refresh token, you'll get both an access token and a refresh token back. And then that new refresh token is the one that needs to be stored. Um, there are also some other... Uh, some other considerations with refresh tokens, there are certain conditions where a user's refresh tokens will be invalidated, um, either through a manual invalidation, like a, a, an administrator can go and revoke your refresh tokens. So if your account got compromised or if you've if something's happened, you've left the company or something, you changed roles or something and they want to revoke them, um, an administrator can manually revoke them, but also on things like password changes, password resets, uh, disabled accounts, there are a few different things, which we'll, we've got a doc that outlines all the different conditions. 
in those cases, your refresh tokens will be invalidated, which means the next time you present this to Azure, present this refresh token Azure AD, Azure AD just will reject it and not give you a new one. Right. So, uh, so we do we do rotate in the sense that we'll send you a new one every time you use one, and the new one is the one that you're going to want to store because that's the one that that gets persisted. If you're using MSAL in any of the languages, Python or um, any of the server side languages, Python, Java, .NET. Um, mm -hmm we handle that for you. So we, whatever ends up in the cache ends up being your new refresh token, but you don't have to do that work yourself if you're using yep. one of the MSAL libraries. Exactly. Um, so the timer function goes and gets a new access token using that refresh token, and then goes and gets the, the graph data. If the graph data is different, if the presence data is different from the last time, then it publishes it to a topic. And the subscribers who are subscribed to that topic in Service Bus receive it, and then they go do their thing, which in my case... I have a, I have a question. Why yes. did you choose Service Bus over Event Grid? Um, because I had specific topics for my, um, for my subscribers, for my presence data, and I wanted okay. to control when the messages were... I wanted to get a little bit more control over the life cycle of the message, so when the message would come in, I would go and right. do work, and if I couldn't finish the work, then I would not complete the message. Oh, interesting. So that's, a, that's one of the really nice things about queuing in general. And, and yep. At least in the, the primary message queues that we have in Service Bus and in, um, and in Azure Storage queues is a, a <clears throat> the way that you use them, mm -hmm. and a lot of it depends on your app, a lot of it depends on your code, uh, right. is try to do the work before you've deleted the message. Right? right. So that way yep. we know the work that needs to be done on that message has been done before the message is deleted. Because if you're halfway through doing the work and your your processor dies, right? Like something dies, some other processor can come and pick it up, right? Because eventually mm -hmm. that message will reappear back on the queue. And so the next worker that comes in to look is going to say, oh, well, I've got this message, right? Yes. The other things to consider, though, are... If you start doing the work, say halfway through, and it stops working or your your processor dies, like what does that mean? Like what's next? Does that mean you have to go and can you just revert the changes you made? If you process the same message one time, ten times, twenty times, does it have, you know, side effects? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have to do like compensating transactions to? to invalidate half of the work being done, right? So yep. if I do a, um, if I'm doing a uh, credit card transaction, for example, right? If mm -hmm. I fail halfway through, but I know I got part of the work done, then that means I most likely have to go and do a compensating transaction as opposed to trying to invalidate the transaction that already happened, right? Yep. Or yep. even in the simple case of, um, I started turning off lights in my house, right? Yeah. But I only got halfway over. Does that mean I need to understand the state and try to revert the state? Or do I just do a completely, do the same operation all over again? It's so a whole thing around um, item potency and, and what can we do in a, a transaction multiple times without having a side effect? And when you're working in these types of queues, a system that understands that and can process the same message 10 times without side effects makes your life as a developer much, much easier because your semantics of how you interact with that queue become, I check the queue, I might peek at a message to see what the data is, I go start to work, and when I know I'm finished with the work, we complete it and we've effectively deleted the message from the queue, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a function that was running locally in a container on a Raspberry Pi that would talk to the Phillips Hue bridge and say, "Hey, set these light, set this light group to a specific, to a specific, uh, specific color, depending on what the act, well, you know, what my presence activity was." And so, this was the one at the office, and then this was the one in my office down here in, uh, in my basement where I am. So you notice, like these two lights back here in the back are green, so I was green at that point. So. Um, and I've turned it off in here now because I want to have decent lighting, but <laughs> most of this work 
most of the work from from the topic downstream is is fairly straightforward. Make an HTTP call. The HTTP call goes out, and it uh, talks to some thing to say, "Hey, go do some some data on this, or go do some mm-hmm. activity on this endpoint," which is fine. The hardest part of all this, by a significant margin, <laughs> was figuring out how do I do token caching the correct way, right? Yes. Technically, right. Technically, this is a web app. Technically, this is what we'd call a confidential client because the client itself, so in our case, the function, the function is capable of storing a secret securely. So we have public clients, which are things like mobile apps, and we have... Um, uh, we have public clients that are that are mobile apps and, and JavaScript apps that run in the browser and uh, apps that like run on your desktop. And then we have confidential apps and confidential apps can store secrets securely. Hopefully people don't have mm-hmm. access to your web server, for example, to get your secrets, right? Or you don't broadcast your secrets on the internet or check them into your source control. <laughs> public clients don't have that benefit. They don't have that luxury. Uh, because they are on a device that you really can't trust, right? Uh, anybody can go find an APK for an Android app, and there are tons of disassemblers out there. Hell, you could run a disassembler in the browser. There are you know, services out there. You upload an APK, and you get code back, right? Yeah. So it's very difficult to store a secret locally on a, on a device that you don't, want your, um, you don't want your consumer to find, right? Yes. Uh- yes. I, I want to slightly interject here because um, while we're talking about the token caching, um, there's something that we were discussing yesterday with regards to the presence, which is the fact that we now we have web, webhooks that support the uh, the getting presence via webhook. So you don't need uh, such an elaborate solution that uh, JP has put here, although it is covering certain scenarios. But the fact that we have... Um, the team's presence now as a webhook means that it becomes a lot easier to register for those events and then respond via a function or whatever else code you decide to use. Uh, which I think a couple of months ago when you implemented this one or four months ago, this didn't exist. It wasn't supported. That's true. So we did not have webhooks yet for um, <clears throat> for presence. So the, the graph, mm-hmm. has, uh, graph has certain objects that have webhooks available. Uh, for things like change tracking. So certain uh, objects in the graph, like the user object, um, I think event objects, or a couple other objects have webhook support. So when one of those changes, your endpoint will get a, will just get a typical sort of webhook call. So you'll get an HTTP ping with um, some identifying data, some identifiers, metadata yep. really, about yep. the event that occurred. And then you go to the graph and go see, okay, cool. Like, what, what are the changes that have happened? And you go get the latest change. Exactly. Which pretty much invalidates mm, <laughs> 75% of this, right? Because we, <laughs> we no longer need a queue. We no longer need... Uh, we, we really can run local functions now. Unless you yeah. wanted to centralize your presence to a single topic and then have your subscribers go off your topic. I was doing a little bit of data enrichment, so I wanted to have a single topic. But yeah. um, this hard part, if you want to call it that, of figuring mm-hmm. out the token cache and figuring out what you were going to do to get those tokens on a reliable basis or on a, on a regular basis. Uh, a lot of that's been invalidated by the fact that webhooks are available for, uh, for presence data now. So you can subscribe yeah. to a webhook uh, to get that data and uh, makes it much easier to, to do this without having some, so much extra infrastructure to make this work. Um, yeah. So I, I killed the mojo here. <laughs> John's like, oh man, all this effort. <laughs> well, it was, I tell you, it was fun to write. And I learned a whole lot about MSAL token caching and exactly how it works rather than um, sort of my assumptions. So because yeah. this is a confidential client, <clears throat> we have a secret that represents our application, right? Or, or some, sign, some type of credential. And in this case, mm-hmm. it's just, a, uh, and, and actually in this case, it was a, um, uh, in this case, it was a certificate. But um, this is also something that we could look at doing with MSI. But we won't worry. Yes. About, we won't broach not for, MSI not for today. Now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't broach no. MSI today. But so because of this, uh, our timer function would need to go back to Azure AD to get a new mm-hmm. access token with that refresh token. Yep. And on the surface, that sounds fairly straightforward. Mm-hmm. 
But at the time, there was no way to properly derive a caching key to know, okay, which row in the database should I go and look for, right? Because in a web app, a user is signed in and, and they, you know, if you're using Node or .NET or, or whatever, a user signed in and there's a cookie. And so you know who the user is because your, whatever the identity component is of your app has signed a user in. Yep. So you know who the user is uh, because they're sitting there in front of you and they're using your app. Um, and it makes it pretty straightforward to say, okay, well, what's my user object or what's my user ID? Uh, yep. Because we know what that is. In .NET, it's stored in a claims collection, and that claims collection gets persisted into a cookie. In uh, like Node with Express, we've got Passport that lets you go back and get user claims after the, they've signed in. So all the different sort of baseline authentication systems that we have available will handle signing mm -hmm. a user in and capturing tokens or capturing claims so that you can go back and use them later. But in our case, a user signed in and then went away. Yep. They weren't sitting in front of the app. So yep. every few seconds or every few minutes, we wanted our app to go get a new access token and query the graph, right? Mm -hmm. But without a user sitting in front of us. And because there's no user sitting in front of us, it made it extremely difficult to determine which cache do I use, right? Yes, it's a per user cache challenge. That's right. And in confidential clients... Uh, like web apps, we need a per user cache. Mm -hmm. So on a device, it's easy because by sort of by definition, this is a per user cache, right? If I have a cache, yep. a, a file in my uh, mm -hmm. in my Outlook app on my phone, that is a per user cache. If I have a file sitting in protected storage in Windows, for example, in my user profile, that's protected storage because it's it's ACL to me and everything else. So even if I have 20 users who are using a Windows box, my profile data is still specific to me. Yep. So if we're saving that MSAL data off into a, uh, if we're saving that MSAL cache into a file in the user's profile, then it's specific to that user. And we know who the user is by virtue of the fact that we only really have one caching file because there's only one user in this profile. Yep, yep. <coughs> um, on the web, we don't have that luxury, right? Because you could have dozens, hundreds, thousands of people using a single web server, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why the individual session, which is sort of dictated by the cookie that sits on a user's box when they're interacting with your app, that individual user session is what we use to drive what the cache key is right like how are we going to go and fetch this data out of the cache yep um it's so that that's that's primarily what's happening here there's a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, sort of flipping through your you know jumping through hoops to make this happen um but we did we did learn a lot about the about the token cache so uh, the first thing though we need to look at is first we have to sign a user in and mm -hmm. in a function that doesn't have any sort of authentication or anything like that turned on uh, how do we do that? So MSAL has a really nice method called get authorization request URL. And the get authorization request URL essentially gives you the URL that you as the user need to be redirected to based on some parameters. So right now it's just scopes. Yeah, because functions don't have a UI to create. I mean, you could set up a, a static website in front of that, but That's right. we can do it dynamically by using the MSAL library. Right. So the MSAL library will handle generating an authorization request. So this is what's going to mm -hmm. take you over to Azure AD. So the actual yes. output of this is something like this. Login.microsoftonline.com slash, you know, your tenant or yep. common. Um, mm -hmm. OAuth2 v2.0 um, authorize, right? So that's our typical endpoint. But then it yep. will also handle putting in things like the client ID, right? So you got your yeah, client ID. Nice. It'll handle things like your um, your scopes. Yep. You know scopes and this with extra query query parameters here gives us a little bit more control to say oh i also want a form post right so this will be oops uh oh well, this will be something like you know uh response mode uh form post now what mm -hmm. you don't see is everything else like the knots yeah. um the um uh like the you know response type all that's done by MSAL, right? So you don't oh, have to nice. 
so you don't have to. Uh... <laughs> It is sort of. It is sort of. A, this is this is probably closer to a, a, a cooking show, right? But um, although I'll say that I spent two or three nights trying to figure out what to do here, and it was so um, it was so incredibly frustrating that I think watching it it would be even worse to watch someone try to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so we end up with a. We end up with a. Uh, oops. With a URL that um, takes you to a page. Yep. where you can actually uh, authenticate as a user. That's right. So the output of this is just a redirect where we redirect you over to the authorization URL um, where you're going to sign in. And the re the big thing is the reply URL comes back to this auth end method here, right? So in, in your app registration in Azure AD, you define the response URL or the redirect URI to be the other function they have here, correct? That's right. So the reply URL is the function URL slash auth slash end, right? Mm -hmm. And so all this is really doing is just returning back the uh, returning back the scopes. And so here we have we're going to acquire our token by authorization code using the code that was in no the code that came back in the response because right. it was an authorization code call. We send this over to Azure AD. Azure AD mm -hmm. signs the user in, and then sends the user back to our endpoint with an authorization code. The authorization code, of course, we can't use it more than once. We use it, uh, it's only valid for a couple minutes anyway. We use that to swap that out with a an actual access token, which acquire token by authorization code does. And like we talked about last week, acquire token by authorization code handles um, uh, really just persists the token into a cache be it mm -hmm. in a memory cache, be it some other kind of a cache, it persists it into a cache, it doesn't actually do anything with it at that point, right? Then you go back and get the cache uh, a little bit later on. Right. Um, so we're going to skip most of this other stuff because most of this is, is other things that, that we'll come back around to a little bit later on. But at least for the for the moment, now we've gotten our token from our authorization code. Yep. Um, and the big thing here is in the MSAL token cache. We should get this open up over here. Is we have a per user table token cache assessor, right? This token, this is the thing that's doing the before access and the after access that we talk about with MSAL. Mm -hmm. So in MSAL, the only thing that we do, again, is we do a before access, we do an after access. And the before access is before the before MSAL is attempting to access the token. So this is our opportunity to take that, to, to go fetch the data from our persistence provider, get the bytes, which we're doing here. So we're going and fetching this from Azure Table Storage. And then we're handling, we're hand, doing a deserialize and handling it back to MSAL. So MSAL handles everything with that, right? So MSAL is dealing with the rest of, um, MSAL is dealing with the rest of the the uh, the work to get a token cache out of there, right? Yeah. The hard part here is determining this user cache key, uh, and mm -hmm. that's what we'll we'll circle circle around to here in a minute. Once we've once MSAL has a cache and it starts writing tokens to it, then it has to go and persist it, right? And so that's what the yep. after access is. So after MSAL has connected to, or after MSAL has built, uh, has written a token to a cache, mm -hmm. um, now it's saying, okay, I'm done with the cache. We need to go and persist it because something has changed. So the, that's what this uh, state change thing here is. That's what the state change um, bool is. It's here in the arguments. And... If it has, we're going to go persist it back into table storage, and this is where we're taking the the bytes that we're given, and we're serializing, asking MSAL to serialize it for us, converting it to a base sixty four string, and then saving it in table storage. Right. Right. Perfect. So now we have a cache that we can use subsequently for um, storing a user's refresh token. And then going and accessing that after the fact, after the user is gone uh, by their name, to go and talk to the graph to get their presence data. So it is the top of the hour. Let's take a couple minutes. Um, yep. Uh, and we will come back and take a look at how we're talking to the graph. Brilliant.
Cool. Be back in five Stay minutes. Stay tuned, everyone. Five minutes. Okay, okay, we're back. So, let's go take a look. Let's go take a look back at our function uh, when it comes time to go and actually get the user's presence from the graph, right? Yes. So, <clears throat> this is how sort of typical of how you'd expect to go and talk to the graph, right? So, we got to go get our account, and we have this identifier. And the identifier, in this case, is where some of the, the extra work <laughs> came in, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, to determine what this identifier is. 
Because if MSAL doesn't know how to address a cache, doesn't know how to go and fetch a cache, then it yeah. can't go and get the correct one. So then things like acquire token silent are just going to, to not work, right? And acquire token silent, typically the way we would we would use this in a normal web app is we would try to acquire one silently. And if we couldn't, for one reason or the other, uh, user, present the UI. we'd have to present the UI, which is this yes. MSAL UI required exception. <laughs> and so back in our other code, uh, in our Blazor app, in fact, I think we had some code specifically for that. Um, to go and fetch some data. Um, oh, no, we didn't because that's right. In Blazor, yeah. we, we had to do it a little bit differently. Uh, yeah. Because in Blazor, we, we don't really have the luxury of redirecting a user because the user never really redirects at all in Blazor. Yeah. Because right? it's, yes. it's all done over WebSocket. So in a typical web app, we would do we would catch this UI required exception, and then we would fling them out, fling the user back out to uh, to Azure AD to go and reauthenticate because for some <laughs> reason they need to reauthenticate. The problem is without a an identifier to know which cache to go and pull, we get this all the time. And because this is kind of like a Microsoft Flow, right, or, or IFTTT, where we're doing this. Um, we're doing this without a user present. If we need a user, there's really nothing for us to do because we can't, the user's not in front of us. Um, yep. So we could do something like send an email or we could we could come back and uh, you know, have the user re-authenticate, but, um, but, but for now we're just, we're just logging it. So once we've done that, then we have an access token and we use the access token to go and request their presence. And this uses a graph SDK, which I know you're quite partial to. Um, I love it. Love <laughs> me some SDKs. <laughs> so, so we've configured our graph service client to use what's called the delegate uh, delegate authentication provider, which really just sort of hands you in the HTTP call before it gets sent. It gives you an opportunity to go and manipulate the headers. So here, mm -hmm. um, this is where we add our access token to our authentication header value, um, which just adds our access token to our, to our HTTP request. Nothing to... Uh, nothing too crazy there, and then we go and, and fetch the go and fetch the user's presence. Why, um, why are you synchronizing the call rather than uh, using async there? Oh, you have you have an await. Oh, you yeah. have get async configure await. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, you're, you're not synchronizing. I need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this goes and gets the user's presence, and if the user's presence has changed. Um, Actually, this just goes and, and stuffs it into the table storage. So we're using table both for the cache and then also for the the history of a user's uh, the history of a user's uh, presence. Right? So this function actually um, has a, an output binding to table storage, so it automatically stuffs it in there. It does. So instead of having to do all the work of wiring up a new table service client and, and connecting to storage on our own, instead. That's the beauty of Azure Functions, right? Having uh, inbound and outbound triggers and bindings, which means that you can have multiple input points and then uh, an outgoing kind of a binding that can be Cosmos, can be table, it can be lots of different things. Yep, that's right. And so in our, our check and update presence, um, in our check and update presence method here, we have our, our tables, which have our user, user, our user list and then also has the last presence table, and then also has our service bus binder, which uh, for functions is a way for us to to push and pull data into into and out of our service bus, right? Mm -hmm. So, and all that's configured here, which is nice because instead of having to have a bunch of extra code specific to creating these table clients or creating a client and creating a table client from that, instead, uh, it's just an attribute on the it's just an attribute on the method signature for a specific parameter. So we're saying, give me a cloud table called subscriber table and use the um, use a table name that comes out of the configuration and use a connection uh, connection string that comes out of a uh, comes out of a connection. And now we have all of our connections to tables and we have our connections to uh, service bus for outputting the. Um, uh, for outputting the, the presence request when it comes out, right? <laughs> so one of the, the big problems that we had, a big problem that, that I encountered with doing this 
was this uh, was figuring out how to derive the cache key uh, based on some sort of external piece of data, right? Yep. So in the after access and the before access, which is when we manipulate the, the token cache itself, if we look at what's in here in the arguments, right? Mm -hmm. We have, let me get my, uh, get my magnifier out here. If we look at what's available in the arguments, we have thing we have something like an account, right? So get this over here a little bit. So we have, oops. Oh, magnifier has broke the focus. It looks like ah, it. There you go. <laughs> so we have things like account, mm -hmm. right? But we have no account because we have no cache. We don't know which cache. So it's very much chicken and egg. So I can't go and get the account because I don't have a configured cache yet. And if you look at the other arguments that are available, all we have are things like the token cache itself, right? Right. Which is cool, except we don't have a token cache yet because we haven't gone to we haven't gone to fetch it. So, uh, and that's an after access. I'll come up a little bit here to before access, and <clears throat> you'll notice the argument types are the same. And so I don't have a token cache because I haven't fetched it yet. I don't have an account because I can't go get the cache to go and do to yep. go and do it yet. So chicken and egg problem. How do we solve this, my friends? <laughs> so what I ended up creating, I gotta get magnifier closed here. So I can get back to it looks like my mouse is in a different place than my uh, my mouse is in a different place. <laughs> I, can't, I can't seem to get rid of the magnifier. Uh, I think it's Windows minus. All right, think. There we go. Back to normal. Did that so, work? <clears throat> it did work. Wow. Um, so this class is called the per user table token cache assessor, right? And is right. a, a cache assessor. So the. Uh, the biggest change here is that we've got this, uh, I've got this, uh, there's a private variable in this class okay. called, user, called user cache key. And that user cache identifier, that user cache key gets set in this, con, uh, in this configure call, right? Right. So every time I need to do something with Imcel, we have to, mm -hmm. we have to configure this cache assessor. So let's go look at our, in order to use that, we have this Imcel cache, um, Factory. Or sorry, an MCL client factory, right? So our MCL client factory is what's actually going to handle creating new, um, creating new per MCL, user MCL objects for identifiers. Us. Okay. Oh, and for MCL. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> and we'll take a look at one right here. So there's this one here for create for identifier, and the identifier gets passed in as a string. So I can send the string in whenever we need one uh, by calling this create for identifier. And it's gonna create a, a confidential client application the same way we would normally in MSAL. Um, but the key here is that the token cache assessor, that configure call that mm -hmm. we have here, this configure that sets the user cache key, it happens here. Right. So we're doing the configuration to say, hey, set that private variable to be this identifier and then we're adding a per user token cache. Right? But you are you're calling this one the create for identifier from somewhere else. So what sets that identifier for us? So the identifier gets set when we use it. So by calling this factory. Yeah. We'll go. So here's our get presence from graph, right? And you're still passing the identifier there. So there must be another call that sets the identifier somewhere, right? So the identifier comes out of the Table store. Ah, uh, but so the first time the, the first time they call it, you don't have something in the table store. How, how do you set it? So the very very first time. So imagine we have completely blank tables. We have completely clear. We have no yes. data about what users we have. The first yep. thing we're doing is up in our function itself. We're calling auth start. Mm -hmm. which has no sort of state data. So nothing state, there's no real state here because it's just creating a redirect URI and sending it to, sending the user down a redirect. Yep. In authentication end, this is where we are setting, um, this is where we, we actually start to persist some data. So right. 
we go and get the code off of the request and we use that to acquire a token with an authorization code. But you'll notice mm -hmm. this create with transient identity here is first, yep. right? So what I learned was if you do any operation on an MSAL cache or in an MSAL object, okay. if you do any operation like acquire token by authorization code, for example, a cache gets created and it's, in, and it's sitting in memory, right? Uh, yeah. Which means there's no way for me to go and pull it later to go and persist it somewhere, right? Yeah. So I end up in a position where I've got this, <laughs> I have an MSAL object that has an in-memory token cache sitting there with the tokens that I need and no mechanism for doing anything access with it, right? <laughs> well, I can access them, for the duration of the request, which of course then it gets then the, the object is trashed and I can't get back yep. to it. Yeah. So what I end up having to do is create one with a transient identity because again, I don't know the user yet. Mm -hmm. All I know is that I've gotten a request with what looks like an authorization code hanging off of it. <clears throat> yep. And we want to ask MSAL to go and get a token for us. But I don't Correct. have an account by then. I don't know the user. I don't know the account. Because if, if you're familiar with OAuth, when you do a an authorization code request, the only thing you get back is the code. So yeah. the URL is, you know, your your redirect URL uh, with one query string parameter called code. Code. Unless you're Apple, because Apple sends a bunch of extra data back in theirs, which is kind of strange because it makes it difficult to pull it out. But the vast majority of implementations send back just a code. They don't send back any extra data um, because the whole point is that we have this authorization code so that no user data or token data touches the browser. Yep. The authorization code is sent via the browser and then the server does a back channel to talk to Azure AD to go get the token. And that way, there's no token data in the browser. There's no, there's really nothing in the browser except for this authorization code, which can only be used, only be used the one time. So by the time we've gotten to line 58, and we've done the acquire token by authorization code, the by function of going through this operation, an in-memory cache has been created by right. default. So we have to create it with this transient identity first, which the transient identity for me is just a new GUID. It's just a GUID. Right, just some random GUID. So we go and get the, once we've done that, by configuring our MSAL object in the factory with a transient identity, which you'll notice there's nothing really special about this here. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we get a new confidential client application builder. We've configured our token cache assessor with uh, a transient ID. And then we've added, yes. a, we've added a per user token cache, right? Right. And the, the token cache itself is this assessor, and the assessor is our per user our to table token sweet. cache assessor. Nice. And because we've set this variable up here for each individual instance of the token cache assessor, because we've set this here, it means that when we go to do a retrieval, we've got the user cache key right here to go and yep. fetch the fetch the, the user's cache, right? So once we've done that we can now go and get the account. And when we get an account, it's you know the account that was used to sign in. So we can get something like a home account ID and get the identifier off of that. And so the last thing that we need to do is toggle that over. So that's what switch transient key to actual means. And really all it's doing is taking that original, is taking that original key, uh, this yep. you know, generated key, and just swapping the row keys over, right? So if we look over here, and we go into update our cache key, Mm. When we look in our in our cache assessor at, up, at uh, the update the cache key, all the cache key is really doing um, is swapping the uh, swapping the row keys, right? Right. So now we've got we're deleting our old one once we know we've gotten a successful insert we're going to delete it mm -hmm. uh after we've gotten our successful insert then we're going to delete it um so that we don't have our old transient one here so it's kind of inefficient in that it is reading a cache writing a net new one and deleting the old one in terms of of the the table records but um this is sort of the most reliable way i found to you know consistently get a cache 
uh, get cash the right way. Right. So the other the other thing that happens is, uh, you know, we we create this what we call a user presence request. Yep. And this is just like an arbitrary table that has the row key and object ID of the user. Mm -hmm. And this is what we use in our timer job to go say, okay, what are who are all of the accounts that want a presence update, right? Yep. So in a way, it's sort of multi-tenanted in that anyone could come and sign up for this app and mm -hmm. start getting subscriptions to their own presence, right? Yeah. So we're storing all of this in table. So we just have the, the, the partition key in this case is just a user account because we didn't have enough, I didn't have enough users at least up front that I really needed to worry about part, repartitioning this. And I'm pulling the whole partition for every timer job anyway to go and, and query through all the users. Now, if, now imagine if everyone in Microsoft came and signed up for your app. That would be what, 250,000 people in your table storage. Yeah, then I'd have to come up with a new cache, a new uh, partition key for my table. But um, for me and the dozen other people who were using this at the time, um, this was this was more than enough, right? So we're creating a new object and and letting functions handle, uh, or no, actually we're doing it ourselves. We're not using a binding here, so we're inserting this object into the the user account partition mm -hmm. um, and then we try to send the user to a hey thanks for signing up you know we'll start doing your stuff we'll start pulling your endpoint uh, we'll start pulling for your presence and pushing it to your endpoint soon so this handles creating the token cache persisting it into storage and then creating a record that that user exists so that in the timer later on the timer job itself or that's that's what the subscriber table is Right. right, so it's this user presence request. The only real query here is that the partition key equals user account. And then mm -hmm. for each one of these users, we're going and, and doing a get presence from the graph. <clears throat> right. And get presence from the graph. Uh, this is where we're doing our MSAL factory again, this create for identifier. Mm -hmm. Because we have an identifier that's stored in database or stored in tables. So now we can create from our MSAL factory an individual identifier or an individual MSAL client uh, yep. just for that specific identifier. Use per that, user, in other correct, words. Correct, per user. We can go and get that account and then go get a token. So that's one we call acquire token silent. And then those Sweet. tokens that come through are specific for that user. So we can go and make the call to get that user's, uh, get that user's presence specifically here. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, we're done. <laughs> so it, nice. only took, it only took, you know, five extra files and a, a constant stream of objects being created and, and torn down yeah. uh, in order to do that. Now, I put in an issue about this uh, specifically because it was a lot of work and, and our guidance in our docs explicitly says if you're using a confidential client application, you need to make sure that you're using a per user token cache, right? And yeah. I struggled to figure out the best way to do it because you could also just use a static key. You could just use a key, it's a string, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, yep. But the problem with that is now you end up with one large cache that has everybody's tokens in it. And that's not mm -hmm. obviously not something you wanna do. You don't wanna commingle tokens uh, from different users, right? In the same cache. Not to mention the caches would eventually get large. If you had more than a few dozen people showing up, Yep. you may end up in a position where your cache the caches themselves are so large that they don't they don't they don't fit <laughs> you've got these enormous caches that are you're trying to load a memory um, and so when you're doing confidential client applications you really do want to focus on how do I create MSAL objects per user and I think the other big thing I sort of learned about this is that we have these objects called confidential client applications, right? Yep. So we're creating this thing called a, um, we're creating a thing called uh, a confidential client application, um, but using this client, confidential client application builder. But in reality, it's not really a confidential client application, right? It's a confidential client application token cache. <laughs> That's really, that's the level of specificity of these objects, right? So the individual client co or confidential client application objects that you get from MSAL, they really have to be unique 
at the token cash level, not at right. the indiv- individual application level. Um, gotcha. You know, because originally I started thinking like, oh, well, I'll just create a singleton and, and inject it, um, inject it in startup, and mm-hmm. swap the caches out on demand. Um, but the more time I spent doing that, the more I realized that was not it wasn't going to be feasible because the application object in MSAL is too broad. It's not specific enough to be uh, to be usable when we need a per user token cache. And so that was the net of all this. That was the net of, of all this sort of uh, all this code that ended up having to be built to make this happen. But um, but it's all out there. And, and as I understand it, uh, this is no longer an issue. <clears throat> so right. um, the issue that was closed this morning was that the identifiers are now sort of derived correctly. I'm not entirely mm-hmm. certain how. <laughs> not entirely certain how that would work unless there are, there's extra data that's being pushed into the arguments. Because originally, you would think if you had an argument for before access, right? If you had an arg yeah. like um, not account because account is sort of a, a sort of a heavy object, but something like login hint, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can a login hints just a string, just a string. If you could send yep. in a login hint and get to this part of the args, then you could swap caches out on a single object, right? Yes. So if you have one confidential client, if you've got a login hint, you can use multiple cache files with that single object and pull back whichever one you needed at runtime, which would be great because then you wouldn't have to go through the trouble of creating new objects every single time. Um, yes. So <clears throat> we need to go and look and see what that see what that looks like for uh, maybe sometime in the next couple of weeks because I'm, it, it's not out in a, not out in the NuGet packages yet. But um, I think it's it's for these types of applications. You know, we're seeing customers build all sorts of things that have all kinds of different mechanisms for how they work together. And you know, I think this is um, you know, only only going to become uh, you know yet another mechanism for for accessing data in the graph, especially as the graph gets more and more robust with all the different services and everything else that it has uh, that's got floating around in there. So this code is out and available. Uh, I wrote a blog post trying to explain some of what we had just explained, but um, it's out there, it's available. I don't think it's terribly, I think part of it's relevant if you're interested in MSAL and token caches um, Mm -hmm. in that it gives you a lot of sort of insight into how to manipulate the cache and maybe not manipulate the cache itself, but how do you do things like store a per user table cache or or per user token cache and how do you use different persistence providers like a table stores to go and do it. and of course, now that we have webhooks for presence data, most of this doesn't matter specifically for presence, but there are, of course, tons of other pieces of data that are available in the graph. And if you're doing anything else that doesn't have a webhook yet in graph, this is one option to consider, especially if that's sort of critical or super important data um, that you want to get webhooks for. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it's out there. Uh, the the local function is, is pretty non um pretty not a there's not really a whole lot to it in fact i never renamed it from function one because it was just pretty pretty minor <laughs> um so all it's doing is is reading from a service bus trigger uh, I, right the, i don't know if anybody's used phillips hughes api before but the light calculating mm-hmm. light colors is super super uh confusing it took me a long time to figure out which light colors i wanted to use for different ones um, but this is it, right? All it's doing is, is getting that there's new data off of the service bus queue and then um, uh, and then dumping that in an HTTP call to the uh, to the API. to the local queue hub, right? That's insane. Why why did they not choose like proper RBG or HTML codes for their colors? It's another proprietary thing they have to deal with. Well, right? I. I don't know if it's necessarily proprietary, but it's it's a calculation of all the different of all the different colors. Plus, I think the luminance is mixed in there somewhere. I don't know. Um, it's like a, an ending all the uh, values into one and then coming up with that. It almost feels like that, right? Well, I ended up in a place. Well, no, it's like it's zero to sixty five thousand or so. I ended up. Oh. I ended up spiraling really deep on like. 
uh, uh, color <laughs> color Twitter and color Stack Overflow where people were having arguments about you know RGB versus sRGB and 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 true color mapping and monitors and all this stuff and I was like okay this is oh this like is... proper audio audio files where you know they will they will argue for hours about sound and headsets <laughs> and what have you. I didn't know there was such a thing for colors, but there you go. There's there's a whole new uh, spectrum of interest that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're you know they're professionals. They're very particular about about colors and about you know uh, what's the word um, <laughs> in exp that, expressing them expressing specifically the color they would like and reproducing exactly the colors they would like. Um, and there's just, I was surprised at the volume of discussion and yet the lack of available answers. Cause, ah, um, right. Everyone has an opinion, but nobody has the solution. I like it. Well, I mean, in fairness, <laughs> that's what we're doing every week, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we do provide some kind of an answer or implementation. Um, uh, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. But at least we are trying to, uh, to show people how to do certain things. No, that's true. Uh, that's true. Uh, as for colors, I only know the basic ones, so um, that's why my wife banned me from teaching my kids colors because <laughs> I would call something pink, and my wife would be, like, "No, no, that's uh, that's purple." It's like uh, it's it's different version of pink in my eyes. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Anyway, um, so I think next week, uh, next week we're gonna do our first sort of podcast slash informational session, right? Indeed, there will be no uh, coding. I mean, there, there might be some discussion about code, but we'll try to make it um, more audio friendly rather than visual friendly. Uh, and we are trying to line up our first guest. So stay tuned. It will be uh, a shorter segment, and uh, we want to make sure that we cover subjects that you would like to hear. So let us know if you have a specific kind of a, a desire or a host that you would like to see or a guest that you would like to see on our show. Very cool. And that'll be next Tuesday, the 28th. Um, this Thursday, we've got our community hours at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, mm -hmm. So be sure to send us your questions on Twitter or on Twitch or wherever. However, you can get a hold of us. Our Twitter names are uh, underneath our faces. So uh, feel free to reach out, send us your questions. I think we're going to take a look at uh, some community code on Thursday too. Um, yes. Now that we're sort of back from vacation and full strength again, at least for a little while. <laughs> yeah, for a little while. We'll see. So, we, need, we need some time off as well at some point, right? Yeah, so... I'm gonna to try to take my kids to the beach and stay as far away from people as possible uh, in a couple of weeks. I'm not quite sure it's gonna how it's gonna work because yeah, I was gonna say good luck with that because <laughs> well, given the current situation <clears throat> and I mean the weather is so nice over here that everybody's trying to be you know, outdoors and stuff. So it's it's hard to avoid people, especially when the weather is nice. Yeah, well, I live in South Carolina too, so yeah, you got your own challenges there. Yeah, where nobody wears a mask. Most people shout at other people about wearing masks, so. It's um, it's kind of a mess here, but you know we <laughs> you work with what you got. Um, exactly. Yeah, you can't so. change the the world around you. So worry about the things that you can control, my friends. Yep. So I think uh, I think we're kind of wrapping up a little bit early today. I know I know we've got some stuff we have to do here in the next 15, 20 minutes. So we're going to wrap it up a little bit early today. I uh, hope you enjoyed yep. it, and we will be back on uh, Thursday, eleven a.m. Uh, taking a look at some community code and let you know about any news views and, and new happenings that are going on. Absolutely. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a lovely day. See you then.